Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. I want to talk with you just a moment this morning about the plan of God. Remember, I, I, maybe I, if you recall that I told you that when I was a young Christian, one of the first ways that I was taught on how to share my faith with others was from uh, Bill Bright's Campus Crusade for Christ. And they came through Decatur, and I remember, remember that it was at the Central Baptist Church, and they came in and they taught us how to share our faith using a little booklet called The Four Spiritual Laws. And on the front of it, it said, Have you ever heard of The Four Spiritual Laws? And, it, and uh, you would use that. You might come up and initiate a conversation with a total stranger and say, Have you ever heard of The Four Spiritual Laws? And uh, the chances are that they had not. And they'd say, No. <laughs> and they'd say, No, instead of go away or leave me alone. So... Uh, you, it was, uh, and then you'd say, just as there are physical laws that govern the physical universe, the law of gravity, the law of physics, and so forth, uh, there are spiritual laws that govern the spiritual universe, of the world that has to do with God. And the first law of the four spiritual laws was this, God loves you, number one. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. But I want to talk with you a little bit about the plan to, today. Uh, look with me in Jeremiah 29:11. And uh, I'd have to say that the King James Version here is not quite as illustrative as, uh, as some other modern translations. More often than not, I, I guess I would have to say that I have many, many years ago fallen in love with the King James Version. But I'm not tied just to, when I study sometimes, I need a little help understanding the words in the Word of God. And, and I have found many wonderful translations of this verse that... Uh, speak to me, and, and really they're just using a different way of saying the same thing. They don't change the Bible, but just use the kind of words that we might use today. But look here, at Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God's saying this, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Look at those words right there. First of all, that the God of the universe... First of all, would even think about me is amazing. That he's ever thought about me at all. You know, you, uh, I was walking the dogs yesterday and we saw some ant hills, and I have to keep the dogs away from the ant hills when they're going out to do their business. Uh, you know, I, I didn't think a thing about any one of those particular ants. I didn't look down to see if I could tell one ant from another. And, uh, you know, that God looked down from his throne in heaven and he thinks about me, and he really does, and he, th he has the ability, the supernatural ability, beyond what you and I can even imagine, to, to know each and every one of us personally and individually, and he thinks about us. I love a song that my friend Brother Randy Brainerd sings called, it, the title of the song, and a part of the song, I know that Linda Sue has either heard it or sung it, while he was on the cross, I was on his mind. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And you know, I believe that. I believe that you can claim that too. He says, I know the thoughts that I think about you. Sometimes if we thought that God was thinking about us, we'd say, God, I know what you're thinking about. You're trying to figure out some kind of way to punish me. You're, kind of, you're angry at me. You're trying to fi figure out some kind of way to make my life miserable. Well, that's not. God says, I know the thoughts that I'm thinking, and they're thoughts of peace and not evil. To give you an expected end. And the, the New International Version, I can't quote it exactly, but it says something like this. God says, uh, this is a different way of saying that in a different translated way. He says, I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you, and it's, it's about good things, not bad things. And he says, my intention is to bring you from where you are to that place. And I believe that that's true. God does have a wonderful plan for your life and for mine. I, you know... I think I've lived uh, 53 years now, and I think over my life, I guess that if I lived my life over, I would go back and I would, might do things differently. And I know that I would make different choices. And as I was sharing with the kids in the, in the land service just a few moments ago, that God wants us and He allows us and He empowers us to make choices and decisions. He wants us to pick things. And he even wants to allow us, uh, I, my, my candidates this morning didn't cooperate, but he even wants to let you change your mind if you want to. As a matter of fact, sometimes changing your mind is a good thing. Uh, I want to share with you, and I want, to make a spe want you to make a special note of this tonight. I'm going to talk with you about the plan of God for just a minute this morning, but tonight I want you to come back at 7 o'clock, and I want to share with you my own personal testimony, and I would call the message tonight the personal testimony of a quitter. 
the personal testimony of a quitter. I don't know if you know that much about me uh, yet. I've shared some of these things from my from the pulpit and messages, but I I knew when God saved me when I became a Christian. I was 14 years of age, and I knew from the moment He saved me just exactly what He wanted me to do and what He wanted me to be. As I stood in line at graduation, I had friends that were all around, around me at the Morgan County High School in 1974. And some of them were just wringing their hands and they say, I'm, I'm about to graduate. They're going to give me a diploma and I have no idea what I'm going to do or what I'm going to be or where I'm going to go. But I, Since I was 14 years of age, four years earlier, four, four years before my graduation, I knew just exactly what God wanted me to do. And I knew what I was going to be. I was going to be a pastor. I was going to be a minister, a preacher, a preacher of God's word and a pastor to God's people. I knew that. And I, I preached my first sermon about two weeks after I became a Christian. And I haven't showed up since, I guess. But in 2004, I resigned from a church that I was pastoring. I resigned. I didn't even hand in my resignation personally. I wrote out my resignation, folded it up, and gave it to one of our deacons. And I asked him to read it for me. I wasn't even going to be there. I said, I'm not going to be there if it, uh, when they open up the meeting Wednesday night, you just stand up and say, here's Brother John's resignation. Here's his letter of resignation. That was in about September of uh, 2004. I boxed up everything in my office, all my books, everything that has to do with a pastor, my pastoral planners, my calendars, and all, all the increments and uh, instruments of being a pastor, everything that I use as one of my tools, I boxed it all up. All my little plaques and my little pictures, all the little knickknacks on my desk, I boxed them up. And every time I took one of those things, whether it was a paperweight or a stapler, I, when I put it in that box, I said, I'll never see this ever again. I'll never get this out of this box. I quit. Put it in that box. Gave away all my books. I gave away thousands and thousands of dollars of books. People would come. I sold some of them just to have gas money. For the most part, I just gave them away. Books that I'd been collecting for 30 years. And I gave them away. And I quit. You know what? I, I didn't answer my phone. I didn't refer to all, my, all the members of my church want to know, where's Brother John? What happened? And then when they called me, I wouldn't take their calls. When they came by the house, I wouldn't come to the door. And I just turned my back completely on everything. Now, I, me and God were still having conversation. I still love the Lord. I know that He still loved me, but I quit. I, I packaged it all up. I boxed it up, and I shut it down. And I walked away from it, and I said, I will never, ever preach again. I'll never preach again. Well, there's more to that story. I'll, come, I'll tell you tonight. I am here to tell you this morning that before you were born, God. If you want to read an interesting part of this story of Jeremiah, read the first chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah came, the Lord came to Jeremiah and God said, well, I want you to be my prophet to the people of Israel. And Jeremiah said, uh, no, I, I don't want to do that. That's, that's not for me. God said, don't, no, don't say no, because I knew you before you were formed in your mother's belly, before you were even Conceived before you were born, before you were even thought of. He says, I knew you. I knew who you were. I knew your name, and I knew just exactly what you were going to be and what you were going to do. So he says, don't, don't refuse. Now, the problem with Jeremiah is that God was actually, literally talking to him. You know, if God's speaking to you, you know, if you woke up tonight and God said, oh, let's talk for a minute. Boy, you're really in a corner there. It's hard to say no. But we do say no to God sometimes. He says, I have a plan for you. And uh, believe me, I, I think when right here, he's trying to tell the people of God and he's telling Jeremiah, he says, listen, have you ever heard someone look up in the sky and he say, you know, I think somebody up there doesn't like me. This is just, I had a flat tire, my car won't start and things are not going my way. I think somebody up there just doesn't like me. Well, that's just not true at all. Somebody up there loves you desperately. He loves you deeply. He loves me. And he has a plan for our life. It's the... It's the if you took the smartest person in the entire world, the smartest person that ever existed, and they knew exactly every detail of everything that was going to happen in the future, and let them plan your life, wouldn't that be a good idea to let that person 
And if it was, especially if it was not just a smart person, not just a person who knew the future, but what if it was someone who loved you beyond measure? Wouldn't it be a good idea if they came to you and said, let me, let me plan your life. Let me, let me figure out where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. Let me design every step and every part of your pathway. Let me lead you every day of your life so that you wind up doing what I know is best for you. Would you let me do that? I don't think it's an unreasonable request. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you that I've gone for it. I said, I'm, I'm in, Lord. And you know, it's not something that's... Uh, I, I did make that decision to receive Christ when I was 14, but I found out that I'm going to have to get up every morning. <laughs> I'm going to have to get up every day. And I don't have to get saved over and over again. I don't have to become a Christian over and over again. But every day of my life, I have to say, Lord, I want to submit to your will. I want to, I, Lord, today I want to do things your way. I want to make your choices. I don't always do that. I don't always make the right decision. I, sometimes I change my mind when I shouldn't. Sometimes I quit when I shouldn't. Sometimes I don't make up my mind at all. Sometimes I won't make a commitment. And those are the times I would say, that when I get off path, when I, when I get off track, are the worst times in my life. Because God, I can point you out at so many times in my life, as I have awakened during the new day, saying, Lord, what I want today is not for everything to go my way. I want everything to go your way, Lord, no matter what it means. I want my choice for my bride, who I'm going to marry. I, I want it to be someone that you've chosen for me. I want to go to the school that you want me to go to. I want to apply for the job that you want me to have. I want to buy the car that is the right car for me. I, I want to spend my money where you want me to spend it. Lord, I want, to, I want you to guide each and every part of my life. And so it's not only sometimes a day-by-day, day, but sometimes it's a moment-by-moment moment thing, saying, Lord, uh, I want to relinquish lordship to you. I want to give you control of my life because I'm always taking it back. Terry and I struggle with this. She does better at it sometimes or another. You know, she's, she's doing all the driving for her mother on their trip to the funeral in Michigan. And her mother probably never questions anything. But Terry, if Terry is sitting with me, she feels an uncontrollable urge to tell me where to turn and how fast to go. And if I miss the turn or the exit, she's always talking to me. Now, that... I don't like that at all, and I'll get angry. And, and you know, I've, I've been, we've been married nearly 33 years, and I'll just look over there and I said, you better be quiet. I'm going to put you out. I'm going to make you walk home. I have pulled over to the side of the road and say, now, we're not going, we're going to go on another mile until you be quiet. Because, you see, men don't really, I think I can speak for all men. We don't care if we miss a turn. We know that I could take another turn later on down the road, and it will lead back to here. I can always turn around if I want to. But I don't want anybody telling me, you know, I've been riding with people in the car and they'll, and they'll drive past the exit and say, why didn't you tell me I was supposed to turn there? I said, man, you're in charge. I ain't your boss. I ain't your co-pilot. I'm just riding along. He said, well, you knew that was the exit. Yeah, but it, it ain't my job to tell you what to do. I had a, I was a, there was a minister friend of mine one time. I pulled up to a station and uh, I was going to get gas. He said, you know, that, that mid-grade gas is a whole lot better for your car. I don't tell people what kind of gas to buy. I don't, why don't people give me unsolicited advice? You're probably one of those kind of people. Are you always telling people what they ought to do that's better than what they're doing? You need to be quiet. Keep your own counsel. So Terry likes to tell me where to turn, where to, where to go, and what to do. So uh, I'll just pull over and I say, look, I don't care how lost we get or how long it takes to get there, but I, I really do need you to be quiet while I'm driving because I need to do this. Well, there are so many times when the Lord is conducting my life and He is driving my life and I, and I act like I know better than He knows. And I'll take the wheel out of His hand or I'll sit in the driver's seat and ask Him to sit in the back. Well, those are not the pleasant times of my life. I have learned better. Well, there's a story that I heard a number of years ago and I, I think it's probably, it could be an urban legend, but I think it's one of those true stories. that I don't have all the details on it, but it was back in the early part of the 20, 20th century, in the early part of the 20th century, when the automobile was just becoming popular, and there was a, a young couple that they were kind of uh, above the curve among most of their peers, and they had, they had a car. 
they had an old Model T car. And you've probably seen pictures of it. Every once in a while, I'll be driving down the road, and I'll see a, an old, one of these old cars. Somebody's got it out on the road, and they're driving it around. And uh, they were driving this. It was a Model T, as the story is told. But it, it quit on them, and they just kind of drifted over to the side of the road. Well, if you can imagine, I don't know if you know much about cars, but you can imagine that if the automobile, when the automobile was just a brand new invention, probably not very many people at all who drove, even drove them and owned them, had any idea in the world what kind of magic made them work. But the gentleman was outside, he had, the, he had rolled the hood up, it was one of those things where the hood just kind of flipped over on the top, and he was wiggling things and touching things, and it, it just didn't sound like it was going to start at all. And they had been like that for about 35 or 40 minutes when someone pulled up behind them in, a, in another vehicle. And he had a long leather slicker on and some goggles and a riding hat and the whole thing because, you know, it's pretty much like driving with the top down, riding with the top down. This gentleman get, got out and he said, well, folks, are y'all having some trouble? And he said, yeah, we just, we, he quit on us. We don't know why and we don't, uh, my husband really don't know what to do to fix it. He said, I'm at a loss. He said, well, let me take a look at it. He didn't have any tools in his hand or anything, but he looked down in there and he just made a few adjustments and he tightened something, and then he adjusted something right over here, and then he pulled the lid back on that thing, or the hood, and he says, all right, now see if it'll start now. They had one of those things where, you know, you crank it from the front, and you hold down a starter inside, kind of like a teamwork effort, and it just cranked right up, and it hummed and purred, and, and they were just so delighted, and so tickled, that young couple, their car was going again. As a matter of fact, the young man says, he says, you know, I think it's running better now than it was when I bought it. He said, well, you must have really studied these cars a lot. And he, they thanked him profusely. They just said, we appreciate you so much for helping us. How in the world is it that you could, you could fix our car when I couldn't even see what was wrong with it? He says, well, folks, he said, uh, I'm just more than happy to help you, and I'm glad you're going to be able to get on your way. But he says, you see, my name is Henry Ford. And he said, I made that car, and I know how to fix it. I know what makes it work. I know when it won't work, how to make it work. So uh, that's the that's book free a story from the rest of the story, I guess. Henry Ford himself, the inventor of the automobile, stopped. You know, that's the way God is. God says, you know what? I made you. I made you. I know how you work, and I hope, know how, what you, I know every part about your personality and everything of that, every thought that you think. I know the way you work best. And it would be good to let Henry Ford fix your car. It would be a very good thing to let the God of all the universe, the God, of, the, our Creator, who made us, lead us, and guide us, and make the adjustments that need to be made in our life and tinker with our life and, and uh, change things that accordingly and point us in the direction and give us directions on how to get from where we are to where we need to go. Let me close with one other illustration. There's a story also, and it's, it's probably a fictional story, but it's a good parable. There's a little boy. He reminds me perhaps a lot of uh, Tyler probably a lot like Tyler. Tyler, have you ever made a, a sailboat? Well, this young man, he, he was very handy with his hands, and he had actually crafted a very nice-looking little sailboat. Put sails on it, had it rigged and everything, and had a rudder on it. It just really looked seaworthy. It looked very nice. And he wouldn't know how seaworthy it was until he took it out to the water. And there's a river that ran down beside the, the city where he lived, and he went out there and took his little sailboat and put it in the water. Now, he was just delighted to see that it just... It, it stood the water, it didn't leak, it didn't sink, and it just sailed right along. But he hadn't thought about putting a, a line on it so that it wouldn't get too far away from him. And to his great horror, in just a few minutes, that thing caught up in the current and was caught by a little breeze, and it sailed away from the shore and just kind of went out into the river and down the river. He followed it along the river for as long as he could, but the current was swift, and before long, he lost sight of his little boat altogether. Well, uh, he'd spent so many hours crafting it and tooling it and sculpting it and making it. He had spent so much of his life and so many of his summer days and summer hours uh, making that little sailboat that he was just heartbroken. He came home and told his mother that he'd lost his little sailboat. She tried to console him, but it was, uh, it was just going to take some time. But as it would happen, as time did pass, that one day, his, uh, about uh, a month and a half or two months later, his mother, he and his mother were in town, and they'd go down, down there to pick up some groceries and supplies. And as they were walking down the sidewalk in the town, down to the store where they're going to get the groceries, he looked inside a little store that was there that sold candy and all different kinds of uh, magical things for children and toys. And as he looked in the storefront window, to his absolute and utter amazement, 
right there in the storefront window, in the center of all the other little trinkets and all the other little games and toys, was his very own sailboat. His sailboat was sitting right there in the window. And he told his mother, he said, Mother, that's my sailboat. And she said, Are you sure? And he says, I, I know that sailboat anyway. Somebody has found my sailboat and they brought it to this store. And they went inside. And he, the little boy explained to the store owner that that was his sailboat, that he had lost it, and now it was here in the, the storefront. And the, the store owner said, well, son, I don't really doubt that you're telling the truth, and this may or may not be your sailboat. But he says, I bought that sailboat from someone who brought it in several weeks ago, and now it's for sale, and I have an investment in it. And uh, I'd, I'd love to give you the little boat, but I, I'm trying to make a living here, and I've got to make a living. And so if you want the little boat, you'll have to buy it. But he says, I'll give you the very best price that I can. And he told him how much it would take to buy the little boat back. Well, the little boy was not uh, put off or dismayed at all. He spent the rest of the summer doing chores and labors and applying himself to the neighborhood and doing everything he could to make a little extra money and to save every penny that he had until finally he had just exactly the right price. His mother took him back to town. The store owner told him that he would keep the little boat and not sell it to anybody but him. He went in and he counted out all of his pennies and all of his nickels, dimes, and quarters. Paid every penny of it, every, every bit of the price. That store owner went to the front window and picked it up like that and so, so happy to place that boat back in the little boy's hand. He said, now next time you tie a string on that before you let it go and sail it. And as they walked outside, they were standing out there on the sidewalk and they were going to go to get in the car to go home. His mother heard him talking to the little boat. And he said, little boat, you're mine again, little sailboat, you're mine again. I made you, and I bought you, and you're twice mine. You're twice mine. I made you, and I bought you. You know the Lord made you. He used your parents to give you life and bring you into this world, your mother and father, whoever they were, whatever the circumstances were. God used them. Regardless of how worthy or unworthy they were to be parents, God gave you and I life. He made us everyone. And when Jesus came to give his life on the cross, he bought us. He bought us. He bought us out of bondage. He paid the ransom. He paid the price. He paid our debt. And we're twice his. But that payment only works if we allow him to apply his dying death, his, his raising life, his, his everlasting life to our account. We have to say, Lord Jesus, I want your plan for my life to begin with Jesus being Lord and Savior of my life. Is the Lord yours today? Is he yours? Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Father, as we come to you in prayer today, help us to see at whatever place we're at in our life that the only thing you're thinking about us is good things. You have good intentions. Lord, you have a wonderful plan that if we will follow it, it will lead us to a life of life that is filled, a life that is fulfilled, a life of joy. Lord, a life that has purpose and meaning. Father, a life that has value. A life where we weed out a lot of the uncertainties and a lot of the fears of life and a lot of the doubt. Father, a lot of the sadness to be peeled away and pulled away and pushed away simply because We've taken the very best course possible. If there's anyone here this morning, Lord, who has not committed themselves to a, a whole life of daily commitment to you, saying, Lord, lead me the way you want me to go today. If they've never taken that very first step of giving their life to you, I pray that they would do that today. If they've taken that first step and they've begun the journey, Father, I pray that you'd give them the courage and the wisdom to keep following that until their day's end, their life's end. And I pray it, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. It's 334.